Well, this, this book, uh, the Song of Solomon, is probably, uh, in our day, one of the most obscure, uh, perhaps difficult books in the Scripture. Uh, it may surprise you to know that through the centuries, um, this book has been one of the most read and loved books uh, in, in all of Christianity. Uh, it's been read and quoted in services and, and, and used in difficult times uh, throughout persecution and a, a big part of that reason is because of the way it has been interpreted historically. Historically, it's been interpreted allegorically, meaning that they take what they see plainly and they, they make it to mean something else. And, and typically, they, they look at that as the relationship between God and Israel or between Jesus and his church. And certainly, uh, as we look this morning, we're going to be able to, to point to some application. But when it comes to Scripture... We always, want to, we always want to take the plain meaning when the plain meaning is possible. All right? So that's a, that's a help for you. As you're reading the Bible, you don't have to sit and look for something hidden or something mysterious. When you're reading the Scripture, read it and take it for what it means. And so as we, as we come to the Song of Solomon, what we see is a picture of of God's design for marriage and sex. And we're going we're gonna to see that this morning. And I know, as soon as I say that, some of you are going, I, I, don't, I don't need to hear this this morning, right? I'm in, I'm in a place where this doesn't apply to me. Uh, maybe you're not to a point where you're ready to be married, but this is going to guide you and help you in that way as you're moving in that direction. Uh, maybe, you're, you, you know, maybe you're in a marriage and you don't see anything at all like this in your life, and you're going, you know, that's just not, that's just not who we are, right? And so I, I, I believe, you know, no matter where you're at this morning, there's something in this. And so hang with me this morning as we look at this. You know, this is what we would call, this is the last of the wisdom books uh, that we have come to. We started with Job. Uh, we looked at Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, Joe's going to look at Ecclesiastes tonight. And so this is the last one of those. Wisdom books are meant to apply to life, right? To real life situations. Uh, that's what wisdom is, right? It's taking the knowledge, that right knowledge, and applying it in the right way. And so when it comes to marriage and sex, God has given us a design in his word. And you know, this book doesn't speak to every part of that, but when we, when we pull it together as a whole, we get a beautiful picture of God's intention. Now, anytime we look at these books, what we like to do at the start is we just like to answer some simple questions, right? The, the W questions. Who, when, where, what, and why. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of do a brief overview, uh, pulling out some essential points this morning. But number one is who. And, and we see in verse 1 of chapter 1, it says the song of songs, which is Solomon's, right? And so it, it, it attributes authorship here to Solomon. Now that's been disputed a good bit. Uh, one of the reasons because of the nature of the subject, this, this devotion between one man and one woman, it doesn't really line up with, with the life of Solomon who was king over Israel and had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And it just, you know, why would I take marriage advice from that man, right? I mean, you know, and, and so there, there's, some, there's some area, but internal evidence tends to point to the authorship of Solomon. Again, this is a man who was given great wisdom, great insight, and although he failed to apply it many times rightly in his own life. And um, it's possible, it's possible that, you know, this is very similar to what we see in Proverbs with the Proverbs 31. This is the ideal relationship that Solomon is, is writing about. <laughs> the ideal, you know, bride and the I ideal groom coming together in this ideal marriage. And so that's a possibility uh, along with Solomon, who we'll see mentioned several times throughout the song. Uh, again, it, it's called the Song of Songs. Um, in 1 Kings chapter 4, we see uh, that Solomon wrote a thousand, over a thousand songs. But this is his pinnacle, right? This is the best of the songs, right? When you see that, uh, we, we see other places in the script, right? King of Kings, Lord of Lords, right? It's the best of, right? So this, you've never heard a song like this, right? That's the, that's the idea here. And so along with Solomon, you have this, this Shulamite woman. Now, she's very obscure. Uh, people have tried to identify who she is, and I'm not going to try and nail that down for you because I don't think we can be certain. I don't think there's any way of knowing uh, exactly who this woman was. Uh, it's, it's very possible this was the first of Solomon's wives, um, but we don't know. We don't know. And so uh, 
Along with her, there's the daughters of Jerusalem, which were probably the women of, of Solomon's court, along with some of his friends. And then at the end, you see the brothers of the Shulamite. And a few times, you'll see a mention of, of the moms in this, in this song, all right? And so that, that, that's the characters that you'll come across as you're, as you're walking through the book. As far as the when, uh, the period of time, uh, the when is going to be uh, during the reign of Solomon, right? So we're looking at 971 to 931 B.C. Everything within the book kind of points to that time period of the United Kingdom under the reign of Solomon. And then kind of surrounding setting, you know, we answer that where question. Uh, you see two primary settings. There's a rural and then there's an urban setting. And, and the rural setting takes place uh, out uh, in, in, the, in the country of the Shulamite, right? Uh, so this would have been the hill country north of Jerusalem. And then moving into the city, the wedding takes place and, and takes place at the home of Solomon. So we see both of those as you're walking through. And you'll, you'll hear imagery that describes you know, country, vineyard type of setting. And sometimes that's actually where they're going, and sometimes that's describing something else entirely different, all right? So we'll see that as we're kind of walking through. It's important to remember, right, this is a song. It's poetic. And so as you're reading or as you're hearing this song, then there's, there's a lot of metaphors, all right, a lot of figurative language. And it, it reads like this, but it means this, all right? Now, that's not allegory. That's just figurative language. We use it all the time. Right, we say the sun is setting, right? That's a, that's a figurative way of, of, of describing what the sun is doing. And we do this every day, all the time. And so when, whenever you're reading through here, it'll say things like, you know, your eyes are like doves, right? <laughs> and, and things like that. So that, that's figurative language pointing to, she's got beautiful eyes, right? Uh, and, and so um, that's the when and the where. As far as the what, probably the simplest way is just to give you a basic outline of the book. And when I mean a basic outline, here's what I mean, right? Chapters 1 through 3 and verse 5 is before the wedding, before the wedding, all right? And then beginning in verse 6 of chapter 3 through verse 1 of chapter 5, we have the wedding and the honeymoon, right? And then chapters 5, verse 2, all the way to the end of the book is after the wedding. And right? that's a simple kind of way to walk through Right before the wedding, the wedding and the honeymoon, and then after the wedding. Now here's the question. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why is this book in the Bible? It doesn't mention God, really, at any point. There in chapter 8 in our scripture meditation, it, it mentioned the Lord. That's not technically there in the Hebrew. Uh, it's possible that that could be a, a right translation, but it's one of two books. The book of Esther also doesn't mention God by name in any place. Uh, but the providence and the hand of God is so clear in the book of Esther, you can't miss it. When you come to the Song of Solomon, that's not necessarily true, although I'm going to point out one place where I believe uh, you see God clearly uh, is the one who is behind the language and the words there. All right? But historians and, and those who are compiling the canon of Scripture have asked the question, does this book belong in the Scripture? You know, why is it here? This is a book that clearly is describing the relationship between a husband and a wife and marital intimacy. And what place does it have in the Word of God? Uh, now, clearly, they've, they've, they've concluded that it does belong. And we know this, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable uh, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, in righteousness. Right? And so we come this morning to this song and we say what? There's something for us, right? It's profitable. It's good for us. In fact, the, the main theme of the Song of Solomon is love. And you know, it's, it's an Eastern uh, love song, uh, an Eastern Oriental poem, and it is fully that, right? It's filled with poetic language. But this is God's revelation of what he intended marriage to be and what he intended uh, that intimate physical relationship with inside of marriage to be. And so it describes sex the way that God intended sex to be. Not involving merely physical activity, but the whole of man. And then ultimately, we'll see, it points forward to our faithful shepherd king, Jesus himself. Right? And so this book on love and marriage is going gonna, gonna to point us to Christ in the end. Now, much like 1 Corinthians... 
The Song of Solomon is timely for us today. Right, we, <laughs> and I, I know you agree, right? We live in a sex-saturated culture, right? We're, we're bombarded by this <laughs> on all sides. It, it creeps into our lives, into our minds, into our hearts, into our marriages. We see, we see casual hookups, cohabitation, heterosexual sin, homosexual sin, fornication, pornography, masturbation, all of these things, you know, are predominant, right? It's happening all the time, every day, everywhere. We're living on this side of the sexual revolution. And we live in a, a day and a time where everything goes, right? Everything goes. <laughs> Anything goes. What, if it feels good, do it. And, and, and here's what I don't want to do, because this is where we failed, I think, as a church. You know, we have kind of stood on our soapbox, and we have said, right, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And we failed, we failed to point to God's good design. So rather than sit back this morning and say, this is bad, this is wrong, don't do this, I want to point you to something better. <laughs> I want to point you to something greater. You know, God has designed within marriage and sex, he's given us this beautiful, <laughs> this beautiful gift. And, and, and so I, this morning, I just want to uphold a better way. Remember, wisdom book, applying life rightly. And when we follow God's plan and we follow God's design, we experience, <laughs> we experience blessing. Oh. There's really, you know, the way the church has typically responded historically has been sex is bad, right? That's, that's kind of the way that the church has responded to this sexual revolution. Bad, wrong, wrong, you know, negatively uh, uh, responding to the blatant attack on God's good design. And, and, and rightly, we should respond negatively to sin and rebellion against God's design. But we, we don't want to throw out God's good gift with with the abuses that we see taking place today. Right, and so, here's what we want to do with our time left. We just want to look at three aspects that we see prevalent in the book, all right, from beginning to end, and, and, and there are three Ds, all right? So I'll just, you, can, you can remember these really easy. Number one is desire. Number two is delight. And number three is devotion, right? Desire, delight, devotion. And these are meant to describe this this marriage relationship, uh, this f intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. And, and I want to be so very clear. I, you can't miss it as you're looking at the book, but I want to I just <laughs> make that so clear at the very outset that God's design for marriage is between one man and one woman for one lifetime. That's God's design, right? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, when it comes to that area of, of physical intimacy that could not be clearer right i mean it, it's so clear that god designed men and women to go together to be together and yet we see deviations of that all over the place and and we see within our culture what we're trying to do away with god's design altogether <laughs> they they've they've taken what belongs to god this marriage relationship and they said what it belongs to anyone and everyone to do with however they want that's not what we see. It's not what we see when we look at the Word of God. And so the very first thing that we see this morning, and, and you see it in verses 2 through 4, this, this desire that, that, that exists within this relationship. Verse 2, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exalt and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. Right. Now, we see here the bride, right? The Shulamite bride, and she, her desire for her future husband, right? And this is before wedding, right? So this is anticipating what is to come. And she says, you know, I want you, right? That's what she's saying, right? And, and it's, you let me kiss you. But, what, but, but it, notice it's more than just physical, 
right? There's, there's more than just a physical attraction here. There's, there's an emotional attraction, right? For your love is better than wine. There's an intellectual uh, characteristic here that, uh, that she's looking at. She's like, everybody looks well upon you. This is a man whose life is her, her, his character sets him apart. So she's looking at her future husband, and she's saying, I want you because, yes, I'm physically attracted to you. I, I'm emotionally attracted to you, and, and I, I'm intellectually attracted to you. This is, this, is, this is dealing with the whole person here. And, and I think that's important, right? Number one, what, what does this tell us? It tells us this desire, this physical, intimate, sexual desire is right, right? It's normal, right? And, and that's good to hear. Right? You, you need to learn how to deal with that. As young men and young women, you're going to experience those desires, and those are God-given desires. They're natural. They're normal. <laughs> and, and men and women should desire one another in this way. But at the same time, we must remember that this desire is not solely physical. If you base your relationship on the physical alone, It's going to come a day when you are sorely disappointed. Right? It's not going to measure up. It's not going to meet your satisfaction. I mean, what happens over time? We change, don't we? Right? We, we, we gain weight. We grow old. We get sick. And if, you're, if your entire relationship is based on the physical, that can be taken away in a moment. In, in an instant. I've, I've talked with, counseled with young couples who have dealt with serious situations where there can be no physical intimacy anymore within a relationship. It's just not possible. And yet, that love still exists. And, 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 and they're able to care for years and years and years for this individual. This per- Why? Because they love them, not simply because of the physical attraction. Because there's an emotional, there's an intellectual, there's a spiritual connection between these, these individuals, right? And, and you know, this desire is, is mutual, right? So we have the, the, the bride looking for her groom, desiring her, broom, her, her groom. And then in chapter 2 and verse 8, we have the groom. And, and if you have a modern translation then it's likely over top of these sections you'll see he or she or, you know, there'll be a title of who's speaking. Those, those are not in the original scriptures, so you just need to know they're not part of the inspired scripture. They're, they're there to be a help to you, and they are helpful uh, as you're walking through to know who's talking, but they're not. And sometimes there's some disagreement over who is speaking when. But in verse 8 of chapter 2, we have Solomon. We have the groom speaking. He says, the voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. Or it's referring to him, right? Verse 10, my beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. Right? So this desire is mutual, right? She's saying, I want you, I want to be with you. He's saying, come away with me. This is a good thing. It's a good desire. And at the same time, notice verse 7 of chapter 2. There's a warning here. Verse 7 says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Now, that verse is going to be repeated three times throughout this song. It's repeated again in chapter 3 and verse 5 and chapter 8 and verse 4. There's this warning. Don't wake up. Don't stir up love until it's time. So the, de- the desire is good. The desire is right. But don't stir up that desire before it's the right time. Now, that's good advice. Right? Because right, this, this design is good. The desire is good. It's given by God. But if you stir that desire, and that can happen in a lot of different ways, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, whether that be whether that be pornography or whether, you know, whether that be a, a relationship that, that, that is outside of the marriage 
uh, you know, whether that be premarital sex or whether that be adultery, you know, <laughs> kind of an illicit affair, whatever you want to call it, you're stirring up love outside the right time. And what does God's word say? Don't do it. Don't do it. Right? Repeatedly, we're told that. Right? There's this prohibition. Why would God say that? Is he trying to rob us of, of this good gift and this good desire? Of course not. Of course not. But he knows, God knows, that when we, when we take of this and, and indulge this desire before the right time, then it's destructive and it's dangerous. Right? It's damaging to our life. Right? This is a wisdom book meant to apply to life. And so take heed to the warning in chapter, or verse 15 of chapter 2. It says, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Right? Now, these vineyards we see over and over again, they're, they're a picture of the woman's body here. That's what it is. Right? So as you're reading through, uh, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear the bride say, I'm opening up my vineyard to you. Right? So he says what? Catch the fox. Anything that will spoil the vineyard, keep it away. Get rid of it. Right? Anything that will hurt the purity of that vineyard, keep it out. Now, that's good advice. Whether you're not married yet or whether you are married yet, there are those things that can spoil that relationship. Get rid of it. Keep it away. Get it out. Right? And, and, and it's possible that you're here this morning and you need to hear that because you are maybe you're married, but you've been... <laughs> playing around in a relationship you know you shouldn't, right? You, you've been kind of, not even necessarily physical yet, but maybe just emotionally you have allowed yourself to become too attached to a member of the opposite sex who's not your husband or your wife. And that can spoil the relationship that you have. And that's certainly true if you're not yet, right? If you're not yet ready to enter into that marriage relationship, what does it say? <laughs> Do not stir up love before the time, right? Hear that, hear that warning, right? Now, we're going to read a large section here of Scripture, and I've, I've prayed about the best way to handle this, and the best way I can think of it is just to read it and not explain a whole lot, all right? So we're going to go to chapter 4, and we're going to move to our second point, which is delight, right? Delight. Uh, beginning in verse 1, just follow along here, right? This, we're leading up to the wedding day, Right, the wedding and the honeymoon, it says, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Behold your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost its young. And, and you know, If you start talking to a member of the opposite sex like that, you're not going to get very far, right? I mean, those are not, that's not the language that we would use. Right? That doesn't translate well, but what's he saying? You've got nice hair and you have nice teeth, right? That's all he's saying. Right? He says, your lips are, are like a scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David built in rows of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. Until the day breeze and the shadows flee, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sinir and, and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. You have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. Now here you see the shift in language. He begins to refer to her not... Now is his what? His bride. So this wedding is taking place. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than, than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon, a garden locked is my sister, my bride, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all the choicest fruits. 
henna with nard, nard and saffron, common and cinnamon with all the trees of frankincense, myrrhs and aloes with all choice spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. Now you hear that imagery, right? A garden locked is my sister, verse 12, my bride, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. What's he saying here? She's a virgin, right? She's kept herself for him, locked up. And notice her response, right? In verse 16, awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Now, this is an unmistakable picture, is it not, of the, of the sexual enjoyment, the physical intimacy of a man and his wife. <laughs> you, you almost blush as you're reading it at times, right? It just, it's this language of, of intimacy, and I think... You see this joy, this enjoyment, this delight that they have in one another. And, and, and there's some things that stand out, right? This, this is right. This is good within a marriage relationship. It should be this way. But I, I think it's important to come to this place of delight. What happens before, before they ever get here is significant. Right? <laughs> this is, I don't have time to go back and look, but chapter 1, the, the Shulamite was unsure of herself right she everyone said she was beautiful but she looked at her dark skin and and it was a it was something to her that she she didn't like about herself right but what does he say you are most beautiful right he assures her right you have no flaw right and so how you speak to your your partner how you speak to your husband or your wife before you ever come to this place right it, there's this verbal this is verbal assurance, this verbal security that's taking place. There's a relationship, a desire. Let's spend some time together before we ever come here that leads to this beautiful moment of delight and enjoyment between a husband and a wife. <laughs> right? And, and, and this, is not, this is not reserved only for the Song of Solomon. Some of you are going, you know, why, why would you do this? You know, why would you even mess with this this morning? But you know, the Bible speaks of this so... You know, you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and you, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, they knew one another. And you come to Proverbs chapter 5. It says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lowly deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. That's in the Bible, right? What do we see in the scripture? That sex is good. It's good. But it's only good within the boundaries that God has fenced in. And, and we can't miss that. We must recognize that the, the biblical prohibitions for sex, they're not intended to deny us of something, something pleasant, but to protect something precious. This is something beautiful and good and right. but it's only good and right within the context of a marriage relationship. Outside of that, what do we see? You're not blind to this, right? There's hurt. There's pain. There's destruction. There's damage. At any time, and, and, and maybe you're here this morning and, and you're kind of already awakening and stirring up that love in your life and in your heart. You, you know, maybe it's just... Maybe you're not even involved with someone else, but it's just, it's just pornography. And you're going, this doesn't hurt anybody. This is just for me. Well, sex was never meant just for you. It was meant to be enjoyed between a husband and a wife. And what you're doing is you are damaging this marriage relationship that you will have before it ever starts. And you're going, come on, pastor, this is church. You know, there, there's not, yeah. <laughs> There, there's, a, there's a bunch of people out there who are struggling with this issue because it's so easily available. And it damages and it hurts and it breaks and it tears apart this relationship that God has designed. And we would do well as his people to what? 
to enjoy God's good gift in the way that he has designed it. So we see this desire and then this delight and understanding. And you hear it in the language that sex is not merely this physical act. It's the mingling here of of two souls, right? It's it's more than just physical intimacy. It's emotional. It's spiritual. And and that's why, right? I mean, God said the, the man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and they will become one flesh. This physical consummation, there's, there's a joining together here that is bigger than just physical. And so when, when, when we have people going from one partner to the ex, you know, our society, <laughs> they, they uphold casual sex. There's no such thing as casual sex. It's costly. It's costly. You're giving away part of yourself. I, I, I've heard it described, you know, Having sex before marriage is like moving into a house without buying it, right? There's, there's no security there. There's no, you move everything in, but any minute somebody could come in and kick you out. The, the, the clear language here that we see repeatedly is, my beloved is mine and I am my beloved. There's, there's a joining together where you belong to one another. Here's the thing. I know that as I'm, I know as I'm preaching this, that, there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of pain around this issue. Because there's already been a lot of, you know, I've blown it in this area. I've messed up in this area. And you say, what do you do? You repent. You turn away from that. And you come back and you walk in purity in this area. That's what you do. <laughs> you, you come back and then you, you do not stir up love until the right time. And that can be a hard and a long process. There's a renewing of the mind that must take place through the word of God. But let's not throw this good gift out because of what the world has done to it. Desire, delight, and the last thing we see is devotion. We read it in our scripture meditation. Verse 6, set me as a seal upon your heart. Chapter 8, verse 6, a seal upon your arm for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it out. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. (laughs) What do you see here? Devotion. You see love that is unstoppable. Nothing can quench it. Nothing can drown it out. How do you come to, to enjoy this kind of love? We have some, some beautiful examples here, right? Even here among our faith family. We have marriage, you know, marriages that have been 60, 50, 60 years. That's devotion. This marriage relationship was meant to last a lifetime. What's he saying there, right? Love is strong as death. Nothing can separate, stop this love but it starts it start this kind of devoted love starts with desire and delighting in one another delighting in your mate your husband your wife and well we, we just don't have time to deal in with with all of this and i know that we said you know we're not going to interpret this allegorically and we don't want to do that right we want to look at the literal plain meaning and and what we see here is the significance of the marriage relationship god devoted a book a whole book of the bible to this issue of marriage and sex because it's so important and the reason it's so important is because of what it represents when we look at the scripture (laughs) your marriage says something more than let me just show you all right, and, and, and this is something we have said often. But as far as application, you know, Ephesians 5.31 is quoting from Genesis chapter 1 and 2. It says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and, and, and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, what you need to hear there is this. The mystery is that God's purpose in designing marriage was to point to a bigger and a greater relationship. The relationship between Jesus and his church. This is is clear imagery we see throughout the New Testament, right? That Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the church, his 
bride. He gave himself for the church. John chapter 14, here, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions where I so would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'll come, right? This is the imagery of the bridegroom coming back for his bride. We see this all over the place. And so this, this book that upholds and extols this marriage relationship is so important because marriage is important. Because it's pointing to a greater reality. Do you realize that your marriage is saying something about who God is? And about what Jesus is like? The way that you love your husband or your wife, the way that you care for them, the way that you relate to one another, it says something about Jesus. And so in application, this this duty, this delight, this desire, you know, or, you know, this devotion, all of these things are meant to what? To show the world how much Christ loves them. Do we not see this as we look at Christ himself? And this, to me, has been the greatest help, because this is my struggle, right? My struggle, personally, is that, that he could love me at all. How, yeah, I, I, I relate more with, you know, with John, you know, John Newton, right? I'm Amazing grace, <laughs> how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, right? That's, I, I'm a, how could God love a wretch like me? And yet, what do we see? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God demonstrated his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What manner of love is this? <laughs> we, we see it in 1 John chapter, over and over again, we see that God has loved us by giving Jesus. You know, this picture of desire that we see in a marriage relationship points to the way in which he desires us. Did Jesus not, what, come to seek and to save that which was lost? Did he, listen, and some of you need to hear this this morning, like I needed to hear this this morning. He loves you. He loves you. Let me take it a step further. He desires you. He desires you. He desires to spend time with you. He desires to know you. Let's take it a step further. He delights in you. He delights in you. God loves you so much. Listen, listen to the language. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 7. We we, we made reference to it already, right? You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. When God looks at you, if, now there's a big if, if you know Jesus Christ if you've experienced his salvation, his forgiveness of sin, if if you've entered into this relationship, he sees no flaw in you. Now, are we flawed? Absolutely. We're flawed, but he sees no flaw. Why? Because he sees the work of Christ. This is the justification that we have in him. that, That Christ has paid for our sin in full. And so when God looks at us, we're flawless. And he desires and delights in us. And he's devoted to. This is the, this is the Romans 8, 8, 37 and 38 of the Old Testament, right? What shall separate me from the love of God? The easy answer is nothing. Absolutely nothing can separate us from his love. This is what we see from this incredible book, this Song of Solomon, right? That That marriage is significant, right? It's significant not just because we experience this joy and this delight and this precious gift that God has given, but because it points to this relationship that we have with Christ himself. Now, as I say that, it's also true that marriage is not ultimate. Meaning that some of you will not experience that, or some of you, you know, there, there, there's some of you who are not going to enjoy that kind of relationship, and yet it points to what? The ultimate relationship that we have with Christ. 
And so we look forward to and we long for the day when we enjoy fellowship with him. And the way that he desires us, there's this mutual desire. That's why we say, as we said at the end of 1 Corinthians last week, come, come, Lord Jesus. Why? Because we want to enjoy this intimacy and this fellowship with him that we only have in part now. My heart's desire this morning is this. First and foremost, if you've never experienced the love of Jesus Christ through saving faith, I pray that you would see his love for you, his desire for you, and you would, you would just come to him in repentance and faith and trust in him and experience this intimacy, this joy, this fellowship that's only possible in Christ. But I also pray at, as a church and as his people that we will uphold God's view of, of marriage and of sex and that we won't compromise, right? Because the world is constantly saying, right, there's something different, there's something better. But we have what's better. We have what's different. So let's hang on to that and hold on to that. I don't know where you're at, but I trust God is working. So let's, let's close in prayer this morning.